If you want to find out why the quality of our foods may matter more than the quantity in order to maintain a healthy metabolic set point, then this episode of the Smart Nutrition Made Simple Show is for you. Welcome to the Smart Nutrition Made Simple Show, where each week you will hear the real world experiences, life lessons, and guided principles that every highly driven man needs to master their health, productivity, and relationships by sharing conversations with the world's most successful people in fitness, nutrition, supplementation, and mindset. Meet your host, Benjamin Brown. He is a fitness and nutrition expert, consultant to Fortune 500 companies and world championship sports teams, a husband and father of three, and has been helping men transform their physiques, optimize their energy, and own their fatherly mission since 2005. Thank you for joining us today, and without further ado, let's jump right in. Hey, what's up guys? Welcome to episode number 76 of the Smart Nutrition Made Simple Show. Today I catch up with Jonathan Baylor. Jonathan is the founder of Wellness Engineering and the world's fastest growing permanent weight loss and diabetes treatment company called Sane Solution. He authored the New York Times bestseller, The Calorie Myth, and The Set Point Diet has registered over 26 patents, and has spoken at Fortune 100 companies and TED conferences for over a decade. His work has been endorsed and implemented by top doctors from Harvard Medical School, Johns Hopkins, the Mayo Clinic, the Cleveland Clinic, and UCLA. Today on the show, we talk about how in each of us, there's a delicate, dynamic, and profound communication system between our brain, our digestive system, and hormones that work to synchronize the chemical processes that regulate how we store body fat. This is basically our body's inner thermostat, which stimulates or suppresses your appetite by raising or lowering your metabolic rate, which is your body's food to fuel process in response to how much fat it thinks you should have. The problem is there are a myriad of factors at play that, for all intents and purposes, wreak havoc with this thermostatic mechanism. So in this episode, we'll discuss the set point diet and how our metabolism adjusts in response to both weight loss and weight gain. We talk about the eat less and exercise more approach and why it is guaranteed to fail. We talk about the hidden factors that determine your weight. And this has to do with your brain, your gut, and your hormones, and as I said, the relationship between those. And then we'll dive into the SANE, S-A-N-E, approach to regulating your metabolism. That stands for satiety, aggression, nutrition, and efficiency, and we'll talk about the nutrition and lifestyle factors that those apply with. And then lastly, but possibly most importantly, we'll talk about how to develop a weight loss mindset that revolves around self-love, how to navigate the shame cycle, and how to stop saying, quote-unquote, what the hell, so you can positively impact your body's set point for long-term permanent weight loss. You guys can find the show notes over at bslnutrition.com forward slash episode 76. Do me a huge favor, and if you love the content that we are putting out here at the Smart Nutrition Made Simple Show, then leave a positive rating and review and share this with someone who needs to know that they matter, that it's not their fault, and that you love them. With that said, I love you. I'm so grateful to have you here spending time with me every week. And with that said, I'll talk to you guys next week. Enjoy this episode. Jonathan Baylor, thank you so much for coming on the Smart Nutrition Made Simple Show. How you doing, brother? Doing great, Ben. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. I'm a huge fan. And, you know, I have to be honest with you. I didn't really know who you were uh, until somewhat recently. And I started to dive into your work because I've been studying a lot about metabolism over the last few years. And I tend to shy away from kind of the, um, the media scene, you, you know, how it is with, with media and not sure about the quality of the information. And I stumbled upon your um, framework around diabetes which we'll talk about and what that term means, but also your book, The Set Point Diet. And as I started to dive into it, man, Jonathan, it was just resonating with me as to the type of things that I talk about one on this show, as well as the way that I work with my clients. So I'm so happy to have you here, so happy to share your information with our uh, listeners. Well, thanks for having me, Ben. I appreciate it. It's always good to get the the science out there because as you very well know, diabetes, which is the coexistence of diabetes and obesity, is without question the number one 
health epidemic we face as a, not just a country, but as a world. So anything we can do to help stem the tide against this is critical. Yeah, absolutely. And so how did you, I mean, I know you come from a science background. So how did you stumble into the, the set point theory, the set point diet and, and all of your work around diabetes? I will not tell you the full story because that's quite long, but let's just say it started when I was very, very young due to a, a catastrophic personal issue. And then I became a personal trainer and was really disappointed both personally and professionally with the results I and my clients were seeing by the conventional just try harder, eat less, exercise more type approach, right. the, or yep. as I like to call it, the starvation and shame base approach to metabolic health. And uh, just the harder I tried, the harder my clients tried, the sicker and sadder we got. And I said to myself, there's got to be something better than this. I was very blessed to be parented by two college professors. So I spoke to my college professor parents. They encouraged me to look at where I was getting my information and to go to the source directly, aka peer-reviewed scientific literature, rather than the fit guy at the gym, sure. which is oftentimes what happens. And I am a geeky engineering person by nature. I worked at Microsoft for 10 years. I love complicated science-y technical things, as odd as that sounds. So I was just like a pig in mud, as they say. And I spent about 15 years of my life just for fun reading peer-reviewed academic research, about 1,300 papers on uh, neurobiology, gastroenterology, endocrinology, and really trying to figure out why something as intuitive as just eat less and exercise more fails so consistently. And man, it, it really blew my mind as to how wrong what I was taught was and how simple and enjoyable actually fixing one's metabolism and being what we like to call naturally slim can be. Yeah, that's one of those really frustrating elements of the fitness world and nutrition world that we're constantly up against. And, uh, you know, every, you talk to any person and they've experienced it in some way, shape or form. And it's, it's really, we, we're often hearing that, uh, you know, calories in, calories out. And if you want to lose weight, all you need to do is decrease your calories. And something that we've talked about quite, re quite frequently on the show with regards to the way our metabolism actually works. I'm on a diet and we increase our exercise, then invariably we tend to back ourselves into a corner. And the metabolism being like a thermostat, as you describe in the book, or a pendulum, if you will, can only go so far before it's going to kick us back in the other direction. And so that's how, that's what you talk about in the set point diet. So please talk about what the research tells us about this quote unquote set point. The thing that is most exciting for me when we're talking about set point is how this has evolved from the set point theory in the early 80s to the set point fact <laughs> nowadays based on what we've seen with modern hormonal and neurological and gastroenterological breakthroughs. Very specifically, I was born in 1983. And interestingly enough, in that same year, there was a book published called The Set Point Diet. Mm -hmm. But you can't copyright book titles. So uh, <laughs> Hachette Book Group also published my book called The Set Point Diet uh, earlier this year. And the real big difference between those two books, aside from 36 years passing between their publication, is in the first edition of the Set Point Diet, written by someone totally different, it was really just eat less and exercise more. There was no, no I, it's sort of shocking. Whereas what we're doing in this publication is showing the research, which is now proving that your, the energy balance system within your body is, 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 in some ways the same as every other system in your body. And this is so critical to understand because like, this is not controversial. It is not controversial that, for example, if your blood sugar goes up, your body will do things to try to bring it back down into a certain range. Right. It's not controversial that if your body temperature goes up, your body will take steps to try to bring it back down. It's not controversial that if you drink a lot of water, your body will automatically send you to the bathroom more. But for some reason, for like the past 40 years in the mainstream, we were like, well, if you eat more, your body is just stupid and inherently flawed, so you're just going to gain weight. And if you just eat less, your body is a passive vessel that has you know, no intelligence, so then you'll just burn fat. And that's not true at all. And we couldn't 
I mean, we could experience experientially prove that, but we couldn't scientifically prove that until we discovered hormones like leptin, which are released in exact proportion to the amount of fat tissue on your body, AKA it is a signal to your brain that says, here's how much fat I have, regulate my appetite based upon that and other types of uh, leptin receptors in the brain. There's many other hormones, but the point is, is that it is just a fact that if you eat more, your body, if it is healthy, will burn more. And if you eat less, your body will burn less. Now, people might say, Jonathan, if that's true, how could anybody ever be obese? And the way to explain that is very simple. You mentioned the metaphor of a thermostat. If your house becomes incredibly warm, you could come to the conclusion that your house does not have a thermostat, or it could be that your thermostat is broken. Mm-hmm. And that's the key distinction here. Your set point or your body's ability to balance you around a healthy point, not just for body fatness, but also for blood pressure and blood sugar, that can be broken. And in fact, you could say that when those systems break, that's when we say you have a disease. Hypertension is the name of the disease when your body loses its ability to balance your blood pressure safely and effectively. Diabetes is the name of the disease where your body loses its ability to balance blood sugar safely and effectively. And obesity is the name of the disease when your body loses its ability to balance energy safely and effectively. And you do not cure diseases through starvation or shame. You cure them yeah. by healing the body. Yeah, and so what you're suggesting is that it's, it's not our fault per se. Is there's, there's fundamental uh, imbalances going on that, that come on because of the quality of the food that we're eating, the environment that we're living in, the amount of stress that we deal with, our lifestyle factors like our sleep, sleep and so on and so forth. It. It is as much our fault, in quotation, if we're struggling with diabetes and obesity today, as it would be our fault if we were struggling with lung cancer and were living in the early 1900s where everyone was like, smoking's fine, right? We were just, smoking is fine. Smoking is good for you. There's no problem smoking. Smoke in front of your kids. You know what? We're actually going to put cigarette lighters in cars even though your kids may burn the hell out of themselves so that smoking is easier while you're driving. So if, if, if the whole society was like, ah, smoking's not a big deal, it's fine for you, and then you got lung cancer, we wouldn't be like, hey, personal responsibility, idiot. Why did you smoke? It's like, because everyone said it was fine. For the vast majority of us who are over the age of 35, we were raised in a culture that says it doesn't matter what you eat, just don't eat too much of it. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't matter how you exercise, just do more of it. Quality is the key and quality is missing from that message. That's a quantity based message. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So we'll jump into exactly what that means from a a food and lifestyle standpoint. But before we do, with regard to the set point, you talk about how there's a few different systems at play um, that kind of determine our weight, right? What can you elaborate just a little bit? There's two layers here. The first is there is a large genetic component to the amount of fat you store on your body. Just like there's a large genetic component to the amount of hair you have on your body or even the height of your body, the width of your body does have a large genetic component. So it is important to understand that researchers estimate that anywhere between 40 and 70% of your body shape is highly genetically influenced. Now, what that doesn't mean is you should throw your hands up and say, I give up. What it does mean is you need to define what success looks like for you, not what success looks like according to some external BS media type thing. Just like you would never feel ashamed for not being six foot six, I hope you never feel ashamed for not being able to see your abs. Because for some people, that is borderline impossible. Okay, so that's the first thing. Genetics play a large component, but no one is genetically predetermined to be unhealthy. Now, the second layer on top of that has to do with the levels of inflammation in your brain, the types of bacteria in your gut, and the balance or lack thereof of various hormones in your body. Yeah, exactly. And and so you talk about in the book how 
the inflammation in each of these systems, the imbalance in these systems, and this sig- and and you know when we talk about metabolism, we talk about the relationship and the interconnectedness between these systems and how they're functioning to keep our body within homeostatic balance. So, what are the, some of the things that happen within these three systems that create this level of imbalance? Some of the easiest to understand and most exciting examples are one around, let's say, inflammation in the brain. Inflammation in the brain, let's take the leptin example I gave earlier. We find that in patients who struggle with chronic obesity, they will have about 25 times as much of the hormone leptin in their bloodstream as someone who doesn't struggle from obesity. And that's happening Mm -hmm. because they have a tremendous amount of fat tissue on their body. So their body is trying to tell their brain, holy moly, we have enough stored energy like down-regulate appetite, up-regulate calorie burn. However, then when we do fMRI scans and we see the brain of these individuals, the leptin receptors in their brain are inflamed. They cannot hear the message that the hormone leptin is trying to communicate. So this, this, this ability to communicate and regulate, again, is broken down because of that inflammation in the brain. That's the brain from a hormonal perspective, things like plummeting levels of the sex hormones, both in both genders, testosterone dropping in men as they age, estrogen dropping in women as they age, the spike of cortisol, hormones like that. These, again, elevate the set point. And then from a gut bacteria perspective, we can look at naturally thin people and we can look at overweight people and we see characteristic and consistent differences in the types or the species of bacteria that live in their stomach. And it would be illegal to do this in humans, but it's been done in mice where we can actually take bacteria from the gut of a thin mouse and put it into the gut of an overweight mouse. And that overweight mouse will spontaneously start to lose weight. That's how powerful little bits of bacteria are. Hey brother, are you struggling to find the energy to function at your best as a businessman, father, and husband? I want you to know you're not alone. And sadly, the conventional wisdom these days around healthy eating and exercise that has saturated the mainstream is flat out wrong. If you wanna find the solution to optimizing your energy and body composition without restrictive dieting, soul-crushing workouts, or adding more to your already stressful and overflowing schedule so that you can finally function like the man you know you can be, then we need to chat. Are you ready to move from exhausted to energized by working smarter, not harder? Go ahead and schedule your free strategy call at www.bslnutrition.com forward slash level up. I'm looking forward to our conversation and enjoy the rest of the show. Well, I think that we're getting a lot closer to being in this realm with, with humans. We know this from fecal transplants for things like, you know, bacterial or you know, parasitic infections like C. difficile and, and things like this, but to the degree that the population of bacteria, good or bad, has such significant influence on our health and our ability to lose weight. It's, it's absolutely profound. And so what you're suggesting is what we feed and what the bacteria eats is a very big indicator in how successful we are with resetting our set point. Is that correct? That's exactly right. And it's also why my heart breaks when I look at one of my heroes, Oprah Winfrey, who to this day, Oprah Winfrey is arguably one of the top 100 most successful people in the history of the planet. Like if you look at where she came from and in the environment in which she came from it and what she's accomplished and the grace and elegance with which she's done that, all the while not being able to control her body. But that's because like she doesn't know that it doesn't matter like how many calories are in the thing you're (laughs) eating. What matters is what the thing you're eating even if it doesn't contain calories, like it's so irrelevant, the calorie thing, even if it doesn't contain calories, if it's causing inflammation in your brain, if it's dysregulating your hormones, and if it's mucking up your gut bacteria, you're going to chronically gain weight, period. And, and focusing on calories is, I mean, it's a little bit like throwing a, a fire extinguisher to someone who's drowning. Like a fire extinguisher is a great tool but not if you're drowning. It's, it's just, it doesn't fit. Yeah, it's one of those things where 
and I'm sure you've experienced this many, many times working with clients individually and through your business, but it, it's, it, you know, a good example potentially is, is when you observe what someone is eating just on their own, maybe there's a lot more processed food and they're consuming, you know, seemingly a high amount of calories relative to what their goals are. And then you take them and you put them on a more whole foods based diet. And oftentimes they'll come back and say, I can't, I, you know, I never realized how much food food this actually is when you're eating whole foods that are, you know, nutrient dense and fibrous and don't contain a whole heck of a lot of calories relative to highly processed foods. That's exactly right. The number one quote unquote complaint that we get in our program is I can't eat all this food. Like the, the amount of food you are telling me to eat is I am too full. What do I do if I cannot follow this program because I can't eat all this food? Yeah. And it's, you know, a good visual would be something like looking at 2000 calories of just uh, of chicken and, and lots of vegetables and some healthy fats and, and see the sheer volume of what that would take up versus basically a supersized, you know, meal at any fast food restaurant, I think would probably be the equivalent. That's right. And I think there's another dimension that people don't um, immediately appreciate because it's not something that is advertised, but we can quickly bring it to the forefront by saying, regardless of the size of the food, there is food that makes you hungrier. Mm -hmm. Like think about that. You can eat food and that food actually makes you want to eat more food in contrast to food that satiates you. I mean, something like Pringles it, it's telling you, once you pop, you can't stop. It's betting you that <laughs> eating 200 of these calories will make you hungrier than if you ate none of them. So you've got one, the food is just smaller, it takes more calories to fill you up, and two, the food hijacks your brain and makes you want more of it in an addictive, almost drug-slash-opiate-like fashion. Well, it's scientifically engineered to do just that. And so that brings us to your SANE, S-A-N-E approach acronym. So what does that acronym stand for? And then walk us through kind of the, uh, the, the principles therein. It's all well and good for us to sit on this show and say, hey, eat high quality food. And if we stop the show at that, we would be doing a disservice to all your listeners because they'd say, what the hell is a high quality food, right? So does that mean it's an expensive food? Oh, if I buy it at Whole Foods, does it that mean it's high quality? Right. Or I buy, you know, everything at Walmart is low quality then, right? And the answer to all of those questions is, is no. Uh, it's, it's much simpler than that. There are four scientific factors that determine whether or not a food is going to heal or harm your metabolism. The first is satiety, or how quickly a calorie fills you up and how long it keeps you full. That's the S in the acronym saying. The A is aggression or the hormonal impact of food. It is not controversial and it is objectively measurable in terms of certain foods, calorie for calorie, causing different levels of insulin to be released, for example. So we've got satiety, aggression, SA. The N is nutrient density, the rate relationship between how many essential vitamins minerals, amino acids, fatty acids, things along those lines that a food contains relative to non-essential things like sugar and uh, things that are addictive and toxic. So that's S-A-N. The E is efficiency. And that is how readily the calories could be stored as body fat. Macronutrients such as protein are not an energy source. When you eat protein and it leaves your stomach, you have zero, zero metabolizable energy. You have amino acids, which could be converted into glucose. But the point is, is that Pretty much any study that's ever been done where they show a replacement of fat or carbohydrate calories with protein calories shows a reduction in body fat because your body just can't efficiently process those calories. Doesn't mean you should eat 100% protein diet, but it does mean that different sources of calories are metabolized more or less efficiently than others. So satiety, aggression, nutrition, and efficiency are the four measurements we can use to objectively determine the quality of a calorie and better than that, because when you go to the grocery store, there isn't like, I want to go get the high satiety foods. That doesn't exist. <laughs> we can break this down much more simply into food groups. So non-starchy vegetables, nutrient-dense protein, whole food fats, and low fructose fruits in that order are the four highest quality food groups, period. It doesn't matter if you buy them at Whole Foods. It doesn't matter if they're fresh or frozen. It doesn't matter if they're inexpensive or expensive, non-starchy vegetables, nutrient-dense protein, whole food fats, and low fructose fruits in that order will transform your life. 
Yeah, that's awesome. And, and I, I don't think this is anything that's, you know, revolutionary for people that are, you know, are, are researching what to eat in the health space. I mean, given with all the different fads out there, it very well could be. And just hearing it from you could help significantly. But if you wouldn't mind sharing, what are just a couple strategies that you use with your patients and clients to help them implement this sane approach? Before I answer that, I do want to mention what you said. Yes, what we're talking about is very sane uppercase and sane lowercase. Like when you hear it, you're like, well, yes, that's of course. However, if you ask anybody how many servings of green leafy vegetables they eat, they ate on average per day over the last seven days, you're, I guarantee you're gonna get a low number, even mm-hmm. for like fitness professionals. So yeah. everyone wants to talk about keto, everyone wants to talk about plant-based, everyone wants to talk about everything except the one thing that everyone agrees on, which is if you, the more non-starchy vegetables you eat, the better your life will be. So like yeah. in some ways that is revolutionary. Like it's not revolutionary to say, being honest and loving to your spouse makes for a great marriage, but a lot of people aren't loving and honest with their spouses. So sometimes we just need a reminder for those obvious things and we need to commit to them and focus on them. And I'll answer your question now, which is the reason people don't eat all those non-starchy vegetables is it's hard and it's inconvenient. We're traveling, we're moving around. If I tell you to eat two pounds of non-starchy vegetables per day, well, what the heck are you going to do? I got small kids. I got a busy job. I'm driving. Smoothies, 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 smoothies. Not because I sell smoothies, not because I have a secret smoothie chain. It's just for me personally, the only way that I have found to get the amount of non-starchy vegetables into your body that you need for the most benefit possible in the modern world is to get a good blender, like a, a Vitamix or a Blendtec or a Ninja, to put a bunch of green leafy vegetables in there, some some low sugar fruits, like some lemons. We have all sorts of recipes. Blend that bad boy up and enjoy one to three glasses or water bottles full of deep green sane smoothies per day. Yep. Yeah, that's that's a very useful tool uh, that a lot of people respond really well to to help them hit their veggie goals and their fiber goals. And this ties directly back to when we're talking about, you know, the the factors that determine this set point because we're feeding the healthy bacteria, the nutrients that it needs to, you know, maintain balance and to fight inflammation in the brain and to, then therefore to help keep those hormones like leptin and ghrelin in balance to, or to control satiety and hunger. So I can appreciate that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, Hey, Jonathan, the last thing I want to touch on here, uh, because this was really profound and I'm so happy that you included it in the book, was just your section on mindset. And it's a very thorough section in mindset. Um, And it's something that not a lot of resources in the health space include, yet it's easily, and I'm sure you agree, one of the most important components to any kind of weight loss or life, you know, weight loss journey. Uh, So what I'd love to know is just a a couple of the things that you share that you think are the most relevant regarding mindset in terms of how people create the right mindset to get long-term success. There's, there's two elements of it. I'll give you sort of the positive and, and the negative. The positive side of it is that if you can strive to see food as the single most beneficial and helpful and therapeutic thing for your body, that is extremely important. And that may seem obvious, but if anyone is listening to this and they are above the age of 40, and especially if they're a woman, they've probably been told that they should avoid food, either Mm. explicitly or inexplicitly. Like, and I'm not here to like demonize fasting or whatever, whatever, but I'm like, there seems to be, Every generation comes up with its new term or its new technique to basically say, here's how to trick your body into staying away from food. Right. Don't do that. Please understand that food is medicine. It is, period. Like, that's the most hackneyed thing ever. Like, Hippocrates, the father of Western medicine, like, for, two, for thousands of years, people have known 
that food, like anything you put in your body can either harm your body or heal your body. And the right kinds of foods you have to eat, you're going to eat, period. So eating the right kinds of things and eating them in abundance is such a clear win. So like know that food is your ally, not your enemy. That's from the positive side. From the negative side of things, it's really important to know that there is nothing you could eat that is as detrimental to your metabolism as feeling ashamed about eating it is detrimental to your metabolism. So let's say that you, whatever, something happens and you eat a donut, God forbid, right? <laughs> there, I, it is a scientific fact that the harm, quote unquote, that that donut does to you is nothing compared to you being like, oh my gosh, I am, I can't believe I did that. I am such a piece of garbage. I can't even control myself. The fact that I ate the donut, you know what? Just forget it. I'm just going to, I'm, this whole week is expired now. It's, it's, it's a loss. It's a wasted thing. Shame is more fattening. Stressing about that kind of stuff is literally more fattening than yes. the sugar you consumed to trigger it. So if you eat something which is objectively not high quality, first of all, that doesn't make you low quality. It doesn't say anything about who you are as a person. You made a choice and you can make a different choice in the future and move forward. But it says nothing about who you are and it says nothing about your intrinsic worth as a person. I love it, man. Profound words of wisdom. Jonathan, I wanna respect your time. Where can people find out more about the Sane Solution and Set Point Diet? If you could go to our website, which is just Sane Solution, S-A-N-E, S-O-L-U-T-I-O-N, SaneSolution.com. We have a tremendous number of resources there that I think you'd really like, and I'd certainly appreciate if you could visit it. Jonathan, thank you so much for your time, man. It's been an absolute privilege and an honor to have you on the show. I appreciate it so much. Good luck with you, and, and um, I'll do everything I can to support you, brother. Thank you, Ben. It's been a pleasure. Take care. Did you love this episode of the Smart Nutrition Made Simple show? Then head on over to iTunes, subscribe, and leave a positive rating and review. And more importantly, share this with other men that you know are dedicated to leveling up in every area of their life by learning how to live healthier, more energetic, and productive lives so that they can optimize their health for their family and future. Thank you for listening. And if you want to find out more about how you can work directly with Ben, then just head on over to www.bslnutrition.com forward slash level up.